uh, for those uh, kind words and that kind introduction. Well, Washington, the last 24 hours, huh? <laughs> Interesting. You know, as I thought about what I would impart to you today, I realized that what we are most in need of now as a nation, as leaders, and as citizens is some inspiration, some insight, and some aspiration to take hold of our better angels. This past week, our nation mourned the passing of a great statesman and maverick in Senator John McCain. But as I reflected on the past week, I think we mourned something more than his passing. All of us glued to our television for days, watching his family, his friends, and his colleagues honor him with their words. All of us longing seemingly for days gone by, days of civility, days of profiles in courage. Leaders like Margaret Chase Smith, Everett Dirksen, Bobby Kennedy, Hubert Humphrey, Tip O'Neill, Ronald Reagan, Jack Kemp, Shirley Chisholm, George H.W. Bush, men and women who reached across the political divide to get things done regardless of party. Men and women who put country first. In my humble opinion, and with this backdrop, the most urgent issue facing us all right now as leaders in the corporate sector and in the public sector is the present climate of national uncertainty and division, of political rancor, racial unrest, the changing rules of inclusion in the workplace, and of course, the Me Too movement, which has truly rocked all institutions to its core. We're operating in a different America, folks, more different even than the one I grew up in in the 1970s and 80s. Demographic shifts, let me say that again because this is important for you to understand, particularly given what all of you do. Demographic shifts are causing discomfort and dis-ease, not disease, dis-ease, <laughs> disruption. America, get this, America will be a majority minority country in 2040. And in just the next year, in 2019, ethnic minority children will be the majority. We must then find a way to exist with one another, to help one another, to lift one another as we ourselves climb beyond our race, beyond our gender, beyond our religion, and beyond our creed. Let me then start with a phrase. E pluribus unum, out of many, one. That's our founding motto, one we need to return to. Let me be clear this morning before I really get going. I do not care what party you're in or about your politics, whether you're liberal or conservative, Republican or Democrat. We are Americans first, at least we should be. What I care about today is preparing you as leaders in corporate America and specifically in the human resources sector to be equipped and engaged about how you will need to handle this ever-changing human capital landscape. It is here that I want to start my remarks with a premise. America, folks, America is the story of us, of all of us. It is the story of dreamers, of risk takers and explorers, of natives and immigrants, of slaves and indentured servants. We all built America together. America is a story indeed. It is a promise. It is a decision that changed the course of mankind. Some of us are conservative. Some of us are liberal. Some of us sit in the middle. And I need you to know that wherever you sit this morning, it's okay. What matters most is not where we sit politically. What matters most is that we love our nation, that we want to pursue the American dream, and that as we age and as we age out and leave, we want to leave a better world for our children and grandchildren. And I'm not just talking about economic power. Too often, in my humble opinion, we spend too much time focusing on money and tax cuts and, and the economy and our stock portfolios. There's more to life than that. I'm talking about people power. Human capital, 
human decency, and human civility. America is indeed a powerful story of us, the collective us. E pluribus unum, out of many, one. There is no other place on earth like America, and our workplaces must reflect the best of America, not just some of us, but all of us. I argue, and I believe this strongly as a woman of color, it is our differences that make us great. It is our diversity of race, religion, creed, and background that pushes us to expand our collective greatness. The reason that America has always endured and prospered is because we're always in the process of perfecting our union. And all of you, as HR leaders and executives, must be always in pursuit of perfecting your companies, of expanding, of sharing, of including. Let me say this. We're in a very difficult time as a country right now. We're in a very challenging time. The last 24 hours just made it a whole lot more challenging. But I want to say something because I think we've gotten ourselves into a, a difficult place of not understanding that disagreement is a good thing. America is founded on the principles of us having the right to dissent. The problem is disagreement now means destruction of your opponent, attacking, tearing down. That's not the best of who we are. We must learn to disagree while defending each other's rights to free speech, free assembly, and the freedom to live as we choose. We need to remember the words that Americans have been willing to sacrifice everything for since 1776. Words like duty, honor, patriotism, bravery, protest, free speech, free press, respect, equality, country. Words we don't use much anymore. Words we play cheap, words we throw around, words we rebuke and revile, reject, words that define what America is supposed to be about. We need to be willing to take the road less traveled by folks. We need to do, as Pam said, and you nailed it, the right thing. It's not about the best practice or what's the safe practice. It's about the right practice. We need to be willing to show our patriotism, sacrifice it all so that others have opportunity and access and what they need to succeed in this great place called America. So it is time for those of us who call ourselves leaders to wake up from our privileged slumber, because all of us in this room are privileged. And remember that every human being who is born is born with those unalienable rights that Thomas Jefferson spoke about in the Declaration of Independence. And in case you forgot what he said, let me remind you. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So how then, given this backdrop of everything I've just said, how do we, us, learn to live together, for real live together, to live out that motto, e pluribus unum, out of many, one. Well, one of my favorite people, she's deceased now, uh, my late sorority sister, the doctor uh, that you all know, Dr. Maya Angelou, said it best. And I want you to remember this because this is kind of what I think as human resource officers, your whole focal point should emanate from this quote. People will forget what you said, People will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. In that spirit, as I close, I challenge you to focus most of all on how you as leaders, as human resource professionals, treat others. And I offer you these nuggets. I'm going to give you a few nuggets that I've incorporated from my book, The Woman Code, that I think are fitting for this occasion. And I want you to focus on just these nuggets because they're really about emotional intelligence. And we all know, particularly again given this room, that emotional intelligence is everything 
in how your company grows, in the people that succeed, and those that don't succeed. They apply to you whether you're white or black, male or female, liberal or conservative, whatever and wherever you sit, we can all be better human beings if we incorporate these simple things. So write these down, tweet these, post them, share them. I don't care. Is there a hashtag? Is there a hashtag for this conference? No? Okay. Well, you can use hashtag HR policy conference. How about that? Or association. That'll work fine. All right. Get ready. All right. The first one is what I like to call lead from within. Lead from within. Now, our emotional IQ is how we assess ourselves and how we assess others. It's, that's the most simple definition I can give you of what your emotional intelligence is all about. And for all the reasons that Pam talked about when she got up here and she kind of gave you an overview of industry and the association, we're in a time right now where emotional intelligence is critical. I call it the three Fs. You need to practice the three Fs of leading from within. And by leading from within, I mean throw away all the textbooks and all the metrics and all that stuff. And let's get back to being human beings. That's what's wrong with us right now. You know that, right? It's the gadgets, it's the devices. We've forgotten how to deal with each other. The three Fs, focused, flexible, fair. Focused, flexible, fair. One of the quickest ways to destroy your business model, your productivity, is to be distracted. And we're all distracted a lot. It goes back to the devices. Focus. Focus on your plan. Work your plan. Focus on your people. Build your people. Flexible. Pam, I heard you say that industry doesn't want to be flexible. The workers want flexibility. Industry wants more productivity. It ain't going to work that way. Flexibility means you're going to meet your workers halfway and you're still going to achieve your goals. Go into that four-hour work, four-day work week. Sounds interesting to me. Letting people telecommute. The studies show people are more productive. We need rest. We're tired. We're weary. Be flexible. Be a flexible leader. And lastly, fair. Now this one is a, is a loaded term because fairness can mean a lot of things to a lot of people. But being fair is simply being open, being receptive, listening to everyone's perspective, not just a few, not just those who look like us or who we're comfortable with, but being inclusive, being fair opening the doors, letting others have a seat at the table, and hearing what they have to offer. Number two, and this is one of my favorites, as HR professionals, but also as corporate leaders and as those coming up the ladder in this room, teach people how to treat you. You teach people how to treat you. What does that mean? What that simply means is, is that you have got to learn your value and your worth, or no one else ever will. Women and women of color in the room, men of color in the room, you can't be so grateful for a job that you forget to negotiate your worth. There's a study that was just put out recently that talked about when women and minorities go for job interviews, HR professionals talked about this, and when women and minorities come into the room and they get offered the job, they never ask for more of a salary than what the job listed. When white males go in for the same job, they say, yeah, I'm going to need, if the job's paying 55, I'm going to need 65. And I'm going to need these benefits. And white men are not shy about that. They don't shrink from that. They're not afraid to say, well, here's what my value is and here's what I think I deserve. For women and people of color, we're afraid to do that because we don't want to rock the boat. We don't want to tell someone that we're valuable. I'm telling you that you determine how people treat you by how you treat you. You need to know your worth and your value by how you project to others confidence. Not cockiness, I said confidence. It's important that you teach people how to treat you, particularly when you are a racial or ethnic minority or female in the workplace. Number three, and this is important, ladies. I'm going to talk bad about us for a moment. Lift others as you climb. Lift others as you climb. It's not all about you. Your success and all of that is great, but if you're not bringing other people up and if you're not building a bench, you're going to fail. Your company's going to fail. Women, we're not great at this. Guys, you're much better at this than we are. And that's because you've had the boys.
boys network. You've been at this a lot longer, so you know how to take care of each other and hook each other up. Ladies, we've got to stop competing so much against each other and start supporting each other and building each other and not being afraid that if the 25-year-old that comes in, I'm 45, she's 25, and gee, she sure is pretty and she sure is sharp. I don't know if I want to elevate her necessarily. I, I mean... I've been the queen bee at the company for a long time. I'm here. I'm successful. Ladies, we have to get rid of that mindset. And every woman in here knows exactly what I'm talking about. Because you've all been subject to it. Every one of us has. A woman that should have mentored us, who maybe just didn't. Maybe she was afraid. Women, it, it, the time is now. The time is now for us to take our seat at the table and to help bring other women to the table. Same for people of color. You have an obligation. You have an obligation to build that bench that I spoke about. My best mentors, ironically, have been white males. And probably that's because of the time I came along as a young lawyer. 99% of the office were white men. And so I've been very lucky and very blessed. And so I don't want you to think I'm saying white men can't be your male, your mentors and sponsors. They absolutely can. They can be some of your best ones. But I want to push us as women and as people of color to also do our part, to lift each other when we get to these senior positions to make sure that we're taking care of each other. Next, this one came directly from my grandmother who had a sixth grade education, country girl from South Carolina. And she used to tell me, baby, never cut what you can untie. <laughs> Well, translation, don't burn bridges. What that means is, and folks, hear me again, in a busy, distracted, device-driven world, we are real quick to cut people off. And with a text <laughs> or an email, if we're feeling generous. Maybe a phone call, but then you've got to be 50 years or older because only those of us at that age pick up the phone and talk to people. <laughs> But never cutting what you can untie, again, for this room is very important because you don't want to lose talent that you've invested in because somebody made a mistake or somebody needs to be groomed or somebody needs to be uh, mentored or sponsored. Invest in your people by going the extra mile. We need to learn again as human beings that we're people first. We fail, we mess up, we get it wrong. It doesn't change in the workplace. Don't be so quick to cut people off. Untie, step back, give second chances. Go the extra mile. Don't burn bridges because what I've learned is that the toes you step on today may be connected to the bottom. You have to kiss tomorrow, <laughs> if I can say that. You know, you gotta be careful. You gotta be very, very careful about how you treat people. So don't burn bridges and never cut what you can untie. Next, and we're almost done. This one's important. Have courageous conversations. Courageous conversations. What does that mean? That means texting is not talking. Let me say that again for those of you who are younger in this room. Texting is not talking. And those of us who are at midlife know better, but we've become victims of this too and now purveyors of it as well. You do not send a text when you're angry. You do not send a text when you have something important to say. We need to remember that conversation is two human beings speaking audibly to one another, like I'm doing right now, and you can talk back to me. That's a conversation. We need to get off the reply to all emails when we want to shame a colleague or out them or embarrass them. We need to start talking. Have somebody into your office. Call a group together. Do a peer review. Get into the practice of understanding that in the time we live now, we have all gotten tragically distracted by our gadgets and our things. And as a result, we're missing out on amazing people. We're missing out on amazing relationships. We're missing out on talent that could be a great benefit to our companies because we're doing this and we're not having those courageous conversations. When a colleague offends you, when a colleague upsets you, don't blackball them. Don't talk bad about them to 10 other people. Go to them and talk to them. Sit them down one-on-one. -on -one. Go to Starbucks, have a coffee. This stuff matters and I'm telling you.
telling you. This is human stuff. This is people stuff. And last, another one from my grandmother. She used to say, know your front row. Know your front row. Again, what does that mean, Grandma? Who are the people in your life? Who are your mentors at work? Who are your sponsors? Who are you mentoring? Who are you sponsoring? Who speaks well of you? Who advocates for you? Are you building a circle of powerful, positive people? Or do you have the people around you that you go to lunch with every day and you complain and you're upset and this ain't right and that ain't right? That's not who you want to be and that's not who you want to be around. Your life circle, leadership principles tell us this, that the five people that you spend the most time with in your life and in your professional life determine your life trajectory. Think about that. The five people I spend the most time with, the people that I talk to the most, the people that I work with the most, those people have a huge part in my destiny and where I end up. Folks, I'm gonna end where I began. We are one America. As President Obama said it best, we're not a black America and a white America, a red or blue America. We are one America. We're different, we look different, we come from different places. But if we're going to succeed as a nation, and if we're going to succeed as corporations, if we're going to succeed as industry giants, and and innovators, we've got to learn how to work together and include one another and hear one another and not be afraid to talk to one another, not be afraid to disagree because somebody's gonna call you a name or somebody may, may think ill of you. We've gotta shape that mindset. It's time, it's time for us as leaders, and this is a room full of leaders, you impact the bottom line of the GDP in this country. You impact the jobs. You impact families. You impact everything that we see and touch day to day. The people in this room have an impact on that. So I challenge you today when you go back to your workplaces to remember our founding model where we started. E pluribus unum out of many, one. Thank you so much. May God bless you.